Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Sleep Charge webinar, Sleep and Mental Health, Cause and Effect. My name is Megan Brooks, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Sleep Charge by Fusion Health. Before we get started today, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items with you. First of all, your lines are muted. However, should you have questions, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we will answer them as time permits at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent out to you. So you'll have it to reference in the future and also to share with any coworkers that might not have been able to attend. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Helgi Helgeson, who will guide us through our webinar. Helgi is the Director of Clinical Operations at Sleep Charge by Fusion Health and has been involved in sleep and sleep technology since graduating with a bachelor's degree in psychology in 1996. He began his career as a sleep technologist at the National University Hospital Sleep Research Lab in Reykjavik, Iceland. Later, he joined the sales and marketing team of Flagla Incorporated. Uh, today, named Embla, part of Natalis, a leading manufacturer of sleep diagnostic equipment. In his role as product specialist, he installed sleep diagnostic equipment and sleep laboratories all over the world, including North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Oceania. He also trained users and distributors in sleep and sleep technology and provided after-sales support. Helgi graduated with a master's degree in psychology from the University of Iceland in 2005. During his time at the University of Iceland, he was an assistant lecturer and taught classes on psychology and psychology, psychological metrics. With his unique background of technology, psychology, academics, and research, all within the field of sleep, Helgi brought his knowledge and experience to Sleep Charge by Fusion Health beginning in 2006. In January of 2012, he assumed the position of Director of Clinical Operations at Fusion Health, responsible for mobile sleep testing and home sleep apnea testing. He also oversees the education and clinical aspects of the Sleep Charge program, enrollment following home sleep apnea testing. It is my pleasure to pass the presentation over to Helgi, who will guide us through this Great presentation. Helgi, are you ready to take it away? I'm ready. Thank you very much for that. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me this, uh, this morning. It is uh, a little drizzly here in Atlanta, and, and, uh, uh, but I'm grateful for you taking the time to, uh, to uh, uh, sit with me, and, and we can uh, uh, learn some, something, I hope, hope, today about uh, sleep, uh, mental health, and emotional health. But uh, I want to begin by kind of pointing out, you know, what good healthy sleep does enable us to do. It is vitally important to us from uh, for, from uh, all all ages in uh, in life, from from newborns uh, up to uh, uh, adolescence and into adulthood and and uh, uh, into into age. Sleep is of extreme importance. Uh, good healthy sleep. Uh, is kind of the uh, the important topic nowadays, as we know how important good sleep is to us. Uh, studies are beginning to show, or have have shown over over the years, kind of seven to eight hours of sleep has been uh, shown to kind of to be the the ideal uh, sleep duration, especially for cognitive functioning. And as we're all busy professionals, we uh, we need to stay sharp. And, uh, and focused in seven to eight hours is uh, a sweet spot to, to aim for. The um, uh, studies have shown that if you sleep less or more than seven to eight hours, uh, reasoning and verbal skills uh, are impacted, but, uh, uh, and also uh, other, other research into more significant aspects as into uh, uh, mortality and, and overall health show that uh, with shorter sleep durations and longer sleep durations, there's an increased risk for mortality. But the sweet spot with lowest mortality rates is of somewhere in the seven to eight hour 
time frame. So that is an important uh, thing to kind of keep in mind as we talk about the uh, the sleep durations and and uh, sleep quality. That is something to, to we'll be uh, checking back on. Now, what will good quality sleep do for you? Well, studies have shown, and I do want to point out that there, there are some excellent resources uh, available. One recent resource I would want to point uh, you to uh, perhaps uh, purchase or, or get uh, either through Audible or through your bookstore would be the book uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, PhD. This is a, a very um, uh, extensive Good nighttime reading. It is about sleep, and it would be very, very good to have on on uh, on your nightstand. That might uh, help you get some uh, get some some uh, uh, good, good quality sleep, as well as learning about the importance of that. It's a very uh, good book on on a summary of a lot of the more recent findings why why we sleep and why it is so vitally important to us. Now, as you can see here on the slide, we talk about that healthy sleep controls weight, keeps cravings in check, uh, sharpens memory and focus. But what the uh, good quality sleeps also enables you to do is, is to make you look more attractive. Beauty sleep is certainly is something that has been studied and has has an impact on uh, kind of a, both not just our our uh, you know as we get get into the talk here about our mental sharpness and and uh, how uh, how uh, light light we are on our uh, on our feet but then also just how how our skin looks and so beauty sleep does really really matter uh it wards off colds and flu it lowers risk of heart attack and stroke and diabetes and it makes you feel happier less depressed and less anxious so uh so there are a lot of things to uh that good quality sleep does for us in the, in the long term. So it is important to, to put sleep on our schedules and it allows uh, our mind and body to rest, recover, and, uh, and recharge. Now, of course, unfortunately, there is, of course, so much discussion uh, and emphasis on, uh, and rightly so, on impaired sleep. Now, what does poor sleep or inadequate sleep do for us? Now, we can see here on, on this slide that it does increase our risk for accidents. We have uh, slower reaction times, microsleeps, and studies have shown that uh, uh, 17 to 19 hours without sleep will actually uh, impair us equal to that of someone being legally intoxicated. Now, the, uh, unfortunately, this is a, a significant issue because according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, driver fatigue is responsible for about 100,000 motor vehicle accidents and about 1,500 uh, deaths every year. Now, sleep deprivation is not only bad for your mind and body, but in, in some cases can also endanger the lives of, of others. A study that tested uh, people with a driving simulator showed that sleep depri uh, depri deprived people drove as badly or worse than someone who was intoxicated. Now, sleep deprivation also magnifies the effects of alcohol on the body. So a drowsy person who then drinks will be even further impaired uh, than a well-rested person who drinks. So, uh, so we do consider this quite, uh, quite a significant um, health, health issue, especially with, in light of the, the number of, of vehicular deaths associated with, with uh, driver fatigue. Now, other points of, 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 uh, of interest here that we talk about our physical health problems as we talk about what is well known and well documented is the increased risk for high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity related to poor quality sleep. And uh, often in, in, in associated with those, uh, with those medical conditions, we do talk about uh, the more common sleep disorders such as uh, obstructive sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome. Uh, the reason why obstructive sleep apnea increases the risk for, for these medical conditions is related to the arousal response. So if I may you know, take a little few, mo few moments to, to describe that to you. So uh, when the, uh, in obstructive sleep apnea, what happens is as we fall asleep, the upper airway becomes, uh, which is all muscular. This is the, the muscles what we require to keep the uh, keep the uh, and support the weight of our skull. 
and uh, within and the, the brain uh, within that. The uh, upper airway is all musculature. So we are looking at the area from the, the nose into the, the back of the throat, the uvula, and into the, uh, the oral cavity, the tongue, and the, and the pharynx. And so all of this area is muscular. Now, once we fall asleep, we lose muscle tone. And this is a normal response to, uh, to relaxation. And this is what we would expect to, to happen through, throughout the body that we go, go limp. But unfortunately for us, the upper airway also loses muscle tone. And so the airway, uh, which during wakefulness is firm and rigid because of our increased muscle tone, we are then able to breathe normally and, and pull air into the lungs without any effort or even having to think about it. The, uh, this becomes more problematic for those with obstructive sleep apnea in that the airway becomes collapsible and actually will suck itself closed. So that leads to apnea. In obstructive sleep apnea, the airway collapses completely, and, but the drive to breathe is still there. The, uh, the uh, breathing centers in the, uh, in, the, in the brain still send information down the spine to the diaphragm to contract, but unfortunately, no air is making it into the lungs. What then occurs is that we are then left with our last uh, uh, amount of or last remaining amounts of, of oxygen in, in the lungs. And that is why we have intermittent hypoxia or drops in oxygen saturation associated with the, uh, these fluctuations in, uh, uh, in or these, uh, the, the lack of air making it in, into, into the body. The brain then recognizes that it's, it's not getting enough oxygen and it awakes uh, the individual. It arouses the, the person from sleep. Now this physiologic response, this arousal is exactly the same as is the fight or flight response. So it is as if somebody would be sitting on, on top of, of the individual and, and squeezing the throat. So it's quite dramatic, but the, uh, and happens can happen, um, you know, dozens of, um, dozens of times throughout the, uh, the, uh, the per hour. So, uh, and, uh, and hundreds of times throughout the night, uh, potentially. Now, when this happens multiple times, this of course arouses the person from sleep. This uh, uh, throws in into the body uh, uh, an influx of stress hormones, cortisol, for example, that elevates our blood pressure. It is as if we're supposed to be going into some action. The same would, would occur, the physiologic response would be the same if we we're walking somewhere and there was all of a sudden a lion in front of us. We would be able to run much faster than we would have anticipated uh, in, in light of the, uh, the stressor that we uh, had in front of us. But here we are not doing any physical exertion. We we are actually sound asleep. So the, uh, the increase of stress hormones, the influx of uh, sugars into our striatal muscles will uh, enable us to, uh, should, should enable us to put, put, put this all to good use. But here we are sound asleep. So there is no physical exertion. What that then does is it leads to, uh, it throws off our metabolism, it throws off our glucose uh, controls. And that is where we also have this increased risk for diabetes. Now the, uh, the, uh, uh, so if once this happens multiple times uh, per hour, multiple dozens or a hundred times throughout the night, this of course cuts away the deep restorative sleep because the brain is constantly arousing, but the drive to sleep remains the same. So we are always put back to go, try to go back to sleep. Uh, these, these awakenings are very brief, so we rarely pay attention to them. Uh, uh, we would have to be awake for 30 to 60 seconds at a time to notice that we were awake. But then uh, because this happens so frequently, we can never get into the deepest, most restorative sleep stages. So we spend the entire night, or those individuals that have sleep apnea, they spend the night in the lightest, less restorative or least restorative sleep stages. And so when they wake up in the morning, they feel sluggish, they feel sleepy during the day, and there you have excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, uh, for, for our, our talk today, we are also talking about not just these physical conditions or these medical conditions, we talk about high blood pressure and diabetes and heart disease and, and obesity, then there are also increased risks for mental health problems. We have uh, before us that we know that depression, anxiety, dementia, and bipolar disorder uh, uh, are linked with, with poor sleep. What is known is that poor sleep and depression are closely linked. Treating conditions, uh, treating one condition will often improve the other. Given that research suggests that 60 to 90% of patients with depression have insomnia, and approximately 20% of people with depression have sleep apnea, 
there is uh, overlap there, looking after our sleep to promote good mental health seems imperative. Now, the uh, uh, studies and, and uh, even in the Harvard Mental Health Newsletter, they've stated that once viewed only as a symptom, sleep problems may actually contribute to psychiatric disorders. Now, people who sleep poorly are much more likely to develop significant mental illness, including depression and anxiety, than those who sleep well. So there is a lot to, uh, lot to think about as it relates to, to improving uh, your overall mental well-being when thinking about uh, your, your, um, your sleep. So that brings us to uh, the men mental health uh, portion here. So traditional thinking relating to sleep and mental health was that it was one directional. Now studies or going back into the medical literature, poor sleep happened because of the mental issues. This was the, uh, the, the previous, previous thinking. Uh, as I've just uh, outlined, you know, it is known that people with depression or bipolar disorder, schizophrenia and the like, sleep poorly. Now it is better understood now that the relationship goes both ways. It is bi-directional. Poor sleep can lead to mental health issues and that's kind of where we were talking about today that it, it was not just looked at as a symptom of a, of a ment psychiatric or a mental disorder. Poor sleep can actually promote or, or instigate these, uh, these things. When looking at the relationship between sleep problems like insomnia and mental health, it quickly becomes clear that those problems can be mutually reinforcing. Now, for example, there is evidence that a lack of sleep can increase a person's propensity for anxiety, and at the same time, being anxious, leading, including anxiousness about falling asleep or, or, having, or being nervous about the, uh, that they're going to be faced with a, a night of, of poor quality sleep, this may actually prevent someone from getting enough sleep. So in this way, these problems can feed into one another and become more difficult to, uh, to resolve. All right. Now, mental health involves cognitive thinking and, and um, harnessing one's attention to stay focused. Uh, uh, we require focus as busy professionals. We need to be sharp in our in our conference calls and in our meetings, and uh, this enables this important uh, includes processing information, you know, storing it in memory, and uh, and then understanding this new information. But and during the day, we are bombarded with with new information constantly. You know, the sleep, good quality sleep, gives the brain some downtime to process all this information. And, uh, and store it in our memory banks. This way, it is available and accessible when needed. Having enough uh, good quality sleep improves concentration, creativity, and it assists with, with learning. And so, uh, so it is, as we talked about earlier, that mental sleep, uh, mental health is important at every stage in life from childhood to, uh, to adulthood. And so what we would then look for in individuals that would be struggling with this, the common symptoms of mental issues would be mood swings, obviously their hallucinations, drug and alcohol abuse, you know, more significantly suicidal and harmful thoughts, you know, social isolation, uh, feeling of helplessness, you know, having low or no energy, and then sleeping too much or too little. And that goes back to our original uh, thinking with the, with the duration of, of sleep, so sleeping too much or too little, uh, that is something to uh, to uh, that would be a, a a symptom that would be significant to uh, to look to. Now, in both short and long term, the amount uh, and quality of our sleep can play a huge role in our overall mental health, including how we feel and how we act towards other people. Even just one night of insufficient sleep can uh, bring on stress and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, at at some point point to becoming uh, or the individual becoming frustrated. So this uh, emotional reactivity becomes uh, becomes a, a a thing to to watch out for. And we know this; we can recognize this if we have uh, if we've had uh, with seen this in our in our kids <laughs> if they are are. <laughs> Have not slept, or they're coming up on their nap. How how grumpy and and how uh, uh, moody they can be. The uh, that's no different for for us uh, uh, busy professional adults. The um, 
the uh, uh, continued and, and chronic sleep deprivation can have even more profound effects, significantly impacting a, a person's overall mood and uh, potentially uh, uh, leading to depression and anxiety, unfortunately. And so the, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, points of uh, where, as we were saying earlier, where these things can be mutually reinforcing. The, uh, you can have uh, a vicious cycle where you have poor sleep uh, leading to, uh, leading to uh, uh, you know, feelings of, of sleepiness and, and not being as sharp during the day. And you can also have, then have, have uh, uh, the nervousness about that you are not going to get the, uh, the, the, uh, the sleep that you, uh, that you need. And then, uh, and then that just becomes a self-fulfilling, self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Uh, research has shown a, a strong link between depression and insomnia. And so, if you have, uh, if you are concerned that you are not getting enough sleep or your sleep is fragmented, the things to look for are those uh, things that we we point to with insomnia would be the uh, difficult time falling asleep, difficult staying time staying asleep and then early morning awakening. So if you are able to fall asleep, but your sleep is fragmented, uh, or you are uh, you know, go going to bed at a reasonable hour, but then you are just looking at the, uh, the, uh, the ceiling, uh, unable to, to fall asleep and toss and turn, or you are going, able to fall asleep, but then you're constantly waking up ahead of the alarm clock, that would, those would be the three telltale signs for, for insomnia and worthwhile to uh, to look to uh, uh, to to help uh, look look for help for for that. Okay. All right. Now, as it relates to our emotional health, so what is emotional health? Now, emotional health is the state of positive psychological functioning, and involves expressing our emotions appropriately for one's age. Now. Uh, once uh, I, I heard, uh, act your age and not your shoe size. And I think this does does uh, uh, come into uh, come into play, especially if we are are sleep deprived. That we are not as uh, uh, calm. We are prone to overreact to criticism and behave impulsively. Now, uh, emotional health involves our thoughts, feelings, and and behaviors. Uh, uh, um, internally and externally. So how we feel about our own uh, overall health and well-being, how we feel about ourselves, self-esteem and so on, but then also how we act towards how we act towards others. Now it emotional health requires managing you know, our emotional actions, engaging the appropriate reactions to situations uh, and preventing unnecessary and, and unhealthy stress. Okay. Now, maintaining positive emotional uh, health uh, is an active process. So there are things that we kind of need to do and we should do on a, on a regular basis to kind of keep our, our emotions uh, or emotional health in, in, in check. Uh, we can do this ourselves. Here are some, there are some things we can do to uh, put emotional health front and center. Uh, we can identify and build uh, our own personal strengths. So you you do pros and cons on uh, on your own uh, uh, personal personal strengths, uh, and that can help to uh, to point to where where improvement is needed or where you can feel confident in uh, in your own abilities. Um, realistically, seeing the positive in all situations, uh, you know, we've heard of, of Pollyanna from time to time. I'm always trying to look at the uh, the bright side of, of things and and uh, looking on the on onto the bright side. There is very often. An upside, and and, uh, and a happy person is is happy with uh, what he what he's got, not with what he is uh, with missing, what he is missing. So uh, so you know, realistically, seeing the positive in all situations will always be a, a good thing. Of course, if we're sleep deprived, it is difficult for us to see this. Or uh, when our batteries are are running low, we uh, we tend to look at the uh, the negative. But uh, emotional health is is such that we uh, helps us to be more attentive to our own thoughts, feelings, and, and behaviors. And then lastly, developing the resiliency to learn and overcome challenging situations. Now, this is where, where I think as of late, we've heard a lot uh, of the term grit 
and resiliency to to handle handle uh, difficult and challenging situations. If we're sleep deprived, uh, this this becomes very very low, and we uh, we uh, with better quality sleep, we would then be able to develop this resiliency and and be able to uh, to uh, deal with criticisms if they are uh, handed to us, and then be able to to learn from them and. Perhaps, as with uh, the the second point, uh, uh, look at the bright side and and then learn learn from them and and, and keep keep our emotions in in, in check. Now, mental and, and emotional health, although separate, are both necessary and do work together uh, uh, cohesively. Now, there are uh, there is overlap here. So poor. So as I was going to say. Is that uh, there are some areas of mental and emotional health that do overlap. Now, processing and reasoning are two essential parts of our personality that allow, that also carry over into mental health. A strong sense of reasoning is required to make sure we aren't losing control of our emotions or becoming unstable. Our decisions on how to react to various scenarios must also be processed very carefully to avoid anxiety or stress. Uh, lacking a balance between processing and reasoning puts our health in an unstable state, and we may experience disorientation, have difficulty functioning efficient, uh, efficiently. So uh, again, seeing how uh, how these these two things overlap, but they are very important both in in tandem and and uh, separately, and then together, fun functioning together like a tag team. But the uh, but it is uh, imperative that uh, at the base of it all is if we maintain good quality sleep, put sleep on our schedule, and uh, that we uh, are set ourselves up for success in handling things. Now, effectively man managing our mental health and our emotional health can reduce stress, fear, anxiety, anger, uh, anger, and um, and depression. So, uh, all right now. As we were just talking about, the uh, mental health uh, and emotional health, they do have these uh, few things in common, as I've just outlined. And uh, the type of sleep that you get uh, can affect the state of your mental health. And if you are, as we've talked about, there because of the bi-directional uh, relationship here, if there are uh, mental health problems, uh, it is not uncommon to uh, struggle with poor sleep as well. But as we said earlier, we, it, it is worth repeating that by treating the sleep disorder, it can actually improve the uh, the mental and the emotional aspect as well. So, so now can we get to the portion here of the talk? So we talk about what can you do to get better quality sleep. So there are three things that we we do point out uh, in addition to sleep hygiene. So you see there, we talk about DTQ. Now, if there is a takeaway from this, uh, this webinar, I would like you to kind of think about your DTQ because these are things that you can control for the most part. Now, some, uh, some are more easier to, uh, to work with than others, and I will get to that in a, in a, in a moment. But uh, these are things that you have in in uh, uh, within your your grasp to uh, to impact and impact in such a way that you could uh, uh, improve improve your sleep. And then lastly, as we get towards the end of the talk, we'll talk about sleep hygiene. And these are your healthy sleep habits. So again, that is something that you firmly have within your grasp to uh, to um, uh, to control. So the fundamentals of sleep. The three things that we want to put a lot of emphasis on, and we encourage you to do the same, uh, is the DTQ. So the D stands for your sleep duration. As I've already mentioned, seven to eight hours is the sweet spot. So that, of course, is uh, dependent upon your sleep schedule. Now, putting sleep on your calendar, putting sleep front and center, means knowing when you are supposed to set your alarm off. Uh, that is your wake time. and then. Ideally, to fall asleep seven to eight hours before then, and then hopefully that the uh, that sleep will will be uh, not fragmented. Uh, there would not be uh, an underlying sleep disorder that is interfering with with that duration, uh, or 
uh, things in, in, in your life that could uh, potentially impact that duration. So this means you uh, setting time aside within your day to, to think about uh, what your sleep schedule is when you head, should hit the pillow and what time you set your alarm to, to go off. All right, so sleep duration is very, very important. And uh, as we've talked about repeatedly, seven to eight hours would be uh, an ideal, ideal goal. Sleep timing. Now, when you sleep. Sleep timing is, uh, is something that also you can uh, impact, but it is something that is, is also tied directly to your internal circadian rhythm. So this is your body clock. Now, sleep timing comes into play especially for those that are shift workers we take this very very seriously in speaking with those that that work uh, uh not on our regular you know, uh, you know morning to afternoon schedule but those that are, require sleeping uh, against their circadian rhythm night shift workers for example their sleep timing is uh is not in their favor because uh if they are going to bed uh, at say 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning, that is when their circadian rhythm is actually in an upswing. When uh, for, for others, they, uh, the, uh, the circadian rhythm is in, in sync with their increased activities throughout the day. The same happens then uh, during the, um, uh, when they are uh, awake past midnight, the circadian rhythm is then in a downswing and where the body is typically expecting that it should be resting, the um, the uh, uh, but they are still awake because they have to perform their duties at work past past midnight, and so that can also be a very difficult time, especially for those that are, are awake at about between four and six a.m. in the morning. That is kind of a, a tough time for anyone that has worked uh, night shift, and and we uh, we in the sleep business we we need to do our night a fair share of night shifts as we perform our our sleep studies at at. Um, at this time, and I remember the, this being quite quite a difficult time to uh, to uh, to maintain full vigilance and and uh, attentiveness to the to the sleep studies, but uh, uh, but that that is because of the uh, the fluctuations in your uh, body clock, your circadian rhythm. So knowing where your circadian timing is, knowing where your circadian rhythm is, and and uh, there are sleep disorders that are are uh, circadian rhythm. Uh, based advanced sleep phase disorder or uh, or delayed sleep phase disorder. So uh, so it is. Those are genetic in nature, and those are where you have individuals that are uh, just uh, their shift their circadian rhythms are are shifted uh, either forward or advanced or delayed uh, back. And so these individuals will often struggle to maintain. Uh, uh, a, a suitable, shall we say, a suitable schedule. They have a tough time waking up. Either they've been awake for several hours and they're they're going to bed at, at seven or eight o'clock in the evening, uh, or they have a tough time waking up to attend school or 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 make it to work on time. And then lastly, uh, sleep quality. How well do you sleep? Now, this uh, there are two things that we want to point out here in relation to the sleep quality and that the first part relates to the things that you can do at your home or in your bedroom to make your sleep environment as conducive to sleep as is possible so uh, so there's quality to be looked at there you know maintaining a, a, a cool sleeping environment uh darkness and we will be uh, darkness in the room and uh, uh you know keeping away from Tablets and and uh, artificial light in the uh, in the hours or minutes before bedtime. So that, there are things that you can do to improve your quality that way. We'll, we will discuss that in more detail uh, as we talk about your sleep hygiene and your sleep good sleep habits. How well do you sleep relating to sleep uh, uh, sleep quality? This is often what is impacted by an underlying sleep disorder. For example, as we've talked about uh, snoring and sleep apnea. Sleep apnea diminishes sleep quality. These uh, fluctuations in, in uh, airflow, these fluctuations in oxygen saturation, and these arousals uh, from the brain to open up the airway and to stimulate your breathing, they cut away your deep restorative sleep and thus diminishing your sleep quality. So a pr proper identification for an underlying sleep disorder 
will be uh, be important. So although, as I said earlier, these are all things that you would have control over, well, you can, uh, through sleep charts, for example, if you are concerned about that snoring is impacting you or a loved one, then we can certainly help with uh, sending out the, uh, the home sleep apnea testing and to get an understanding of what happens in your sleep. So that is something that you can you can do, but it would require uh, testing and, and uh, some uh, uh, intervention there to get to the heart of, of the, the sleep quality. But the uh, if your sleep duration is adequate, if your sleeping sleep timing is adequate, but you still feel uh, uh, you know you're, you're, you're during the day that you are sleepy or you wake up unrefreshed then that would give us an idea that or give you an idea that, that your sleep quality might be uh, might be lacking and that might be worthwhile to uh, to look into so those would be the, the the three things that we would want to to help you to uh, to look into there are things that you can do yourself to uh, to improve uh, these these things the sleep duration identifying uh, where you are sleeping with regards to your circadian timing. Uh, and then uh, if your sleep quality is, uh, is, is insufficient, uh, that may, may need some, uh, some testing, but we can help with that as well. And then, so uh, what to look for as we were talking about the daytime sleepiness, if you think that you're not getting any one of those three, three things, it would be uh, normal to feel moody and, easily angered and frustrated if you are, are fatigued. The same, uh, same goes for if you are taking more sick days or, or being tardy, unfortunately. Uh, complacent and less aware of your surroundings and that we are now getting back into the uh, emotional aspects of the, um, uh, of the impact of, of poor, poor sleep or short sleep. And then uh, uh, fatigue is a good indicator that Sleep and health, sleep health, and mental and emotional health are are out of out of out of sync. And then, uh, as we get, draw here to uh, the the latter part here of the of the talk, uh, sleep hygiene. This is very very important because everybody would benefit from taking uh, uh, taking stock of their sleep environment uh, and uh, and making it also that uh, that sleep would be uh, uh, an integral part of their their uh, oh, you know overall day and and uh, uh, and routine positive daily practices uh, uh, can promote better sleep so the first aspect that we we always emphasize is follow a morning and night routine so if we recall if we if there are parents in the um, in the audience we know how important it is for setting these rules bedtimes and wake up times for our kids it is uh, interesting what how lax we become as we age, and uh, I myself uh, guilty of that. But having a consistent morning and night uh, routine, uh, having a consistent bedtime and uh, wake up schedule, this strengthens the circadian rhythm. So this will play into strengthening the T component of the DTQ, the timing. So uh, so that by strengthening the circadian uh, rhythm. Uh, it will help to promote sleep uh, at an appropriate time in the evening and make it so that you would then be more energetic in the morning. And that is where keeping a consistent wake and sleep time also is, is, uh, is important. Get the recommended hours of sleep. As we've talked about here, seven to eight hours is the sweet spot. Uh, sleeping less uh, and sleeping more. Uh, is associated with lack of focus, and uh, as busy professionals, that is the last thing that we need. Uh, daily exercise will help. The uh, uh, you know diet and exercise is is extremely important. The three pillars of health: sleep is just as an important uh, pillar with with those things. Uh, I will warn though that daily exercise should not take place in the hours before sleep. The uh, uh, timing of the exercise is actually more important, uh, especially if you do exercise very late in the evening. What you are then doing is you're elevating your body, core body temperature, and that will uh, go against keeping a consistent wake and sleep time, uh, number two. By, by elevating the core body temperature after your exercise, although exercise may lead to fatigue, muscular fatigue, and you'd be 
ready for a nap, it will actually take you longer to fall asleep because the, uh, the, the, the body is expecting to, or actually needs to lower its core body temperature by one to two degrees uh, to promote sleep. So if you've exercised in the hours before sleep, that will actually uh, uh, delay your sleep. As we get to uh, your, your uh, bedroom and, and to the sleep, sleep environment, create a sleep sanctuary. Now that does mean uh, the, um, that you can make, make the room or the bedroom in such a way that it is conducive to sleep. That means uh, ideally uh, uh, bedroom temperature of 68 degrees. That is, studies have shown that 68 degrees Fahrenheit kind of is the sweet spot for, for making the bedroom um, um, uh, conducive to sleep. Uh, this is a few degrees colder than typically on, uh, in, in room temperature. Uh, again, the body needs to lower its temperature before, so it is to promote sleep. It is easier to fall asleep in a cooler bedroom. Uh, darkness, uh, making the room as dark as possible. Uh, because light will uh, impact the uh, production of melatonin. So if you uh, have light in the room, the uh, melatonin production will be reduced and it delays our sleep. The th same then goes for, and that is directly related to, to remove electronics from the bedroom. The uh, tablets and smartphones <clears throat> are not doing us any favors, both the, uh, the content may make us more stressed. Uh, we are, if we're needing to follow up on emails, it will, uh, that will not be very conducive to our sleep. Um, the, uh, this ties into the, uh, the sanctuary part of our um, uh, discussion here of the bedroom because we need the room to be stress-free. Uh, electronics will diminish our, the light from the, the tablets will, uh, coming into the retinas will a lower melatonin production and will delay sleep. Uh, also, as I was saying, the content, if you are uh, watching something and it's very exciting or you're stressed over work, uh, relating to the uh, or following up on work emails, that again will also reduce your sleep quality uh, or reduce your sleep time because your, the, uh, the content is, uh, is uh, stressful. Uh, alcohol and caffeine before bedtime should be uh, at a minimum, the half time, or sorry, the half life of caffeine is quite long. So, uh, so drinking coffee, drinking coffee before uh, uh, bedtime, uh, coffee being caffeine being a stimulant is not a good idea. The last cup of coffee should be somewhere between two and four p.m. because of the uh, the, the half half life of uh, of caffeine. Alcohol is uh, is a bit of a, a conundrum here in that. Drinking alcohol will actually help promote us to, to sleep. So we will fall, we'll be sleepy and we'll be able to fall asleep. However, the breakdown of the chemicals in the liver will actually fragment our sleep. So once we are asleep, we're not going to get the deep quality sleep with alcohol. So we will make, may, uh, make us more sleepy, but the sleep that we get subsequently will be of lesser quality. Uh, and re reducing food intake, uh, at night, uh, because we will then be putting a lot of, of blood flow into our, our, our stomachs and into our gastro, gastro uh, intestinal tract. So it, it, it puts uh, more energy there towards away from the brain, and it will fragment our sleep. Uh, also, increased risk for um, uh, heartburn and, and those things that, that are, uh, would be uh, detrimental to sleep quality as well. And then as part of kind of close to you know, creating a sleep sanctuary and following a morning and night routine, Make time to relax before before bed. Uh, make time to kind of let the body know that you are ready to go to sleep. And uh, meditation is uh, is a good thing, or just kind of you know zoning out just a little bit, kind of reducing the lights in the house uh, and um, and uh, not getting engaged into too many uh, stressful activities before before bed, because that will impact our, our sleep negatively. And then lastly, it's not just you, it's, uh, it's everybody in the household. Um, family schedules are, are, are good, um, 
because you know if 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 people are staying awake if one person in the household is 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 walking about or watching television downstairs obviously that's going to uh, uh be uh, be disruptive to uh, to others so and it's not just uh, the adults that need to think about this uh for school and for kids uh sleep is of vital vital importance both for learning and um, and how they uh, retain the things that they're supposed to learn their algebra and their history but then also uh, how they feel during the, uh, the, the day. And then uh, lastly, going back to the things that you can do uh, to determine your uh, DT and Q, the, the um, DTQ, the duration, timing, and quality of your sleep, there's a link, sleepcharge.com uh, forward slash TCCC, that you can then enroll into or take, a, take our sleep assessment and uh, uh, your uh, uh, results will be made available to you with uh, <clears throat> with uh, uh, with um, uh, ideas uh, and some suggestions as to what can be done to improve these things uh, for you. And again, our phone number there. If you have questions, you can email sleep at fusionhealth.com, and we'd be quick to respond. And that is it from my part. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Helgi. This has been a great presentation. Um, we do have a few questions that have popped up in the chat box here. Um, the first question is, if I take the sleep charge DTQ checkup, how long will it take? Um, Helgi, do you want to answer that or would you like me to? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the checkup itself is uh, would be no more than 10 minutes. Uh, I think uh, somewhere between seven and, and ten minutes in total to start. Uh, you will, from there, be able to, because uh, uh, you will be providing uh, contact information. Uh, you will be then given access to the sleepcharge.com um, uh, patient portal, or we call it the communication center. Uh, there, you will have access to the uh, uh, the results and the reports. Uh, and uh, and then from there, you we can then move forward and give you uh, an idea of, of um, uh, what next steps would be potential based upon how you answered the uh, the, the assessment. And this also uh, allows, uh, because of the way the program is put together through Coca Cola and your um, uh, and United Healthcare, dependents are also uh, uh, are. Uh, eligible to uh, to take the health assessment and uh, and enroll into the program if uh, if needed. Great. Um, the next question I have is, what is the latest time you would recommend to have caffeine in the day? Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, with caffeine, somewhere between the two and four four p.m. Uh, time frame. Obviously, it does depend upon when when night, your um, uh, regular uh, nighttime schedule is or bedtime is. So, if we say somewhere in the ten eleven o'clock time frame, because of the half life of caffeine, uh, I think the last cup of coffee would be uh, four o'clock. I think that's a safe assumption. Anything later, and uh, caffeine would still be present in the system when you are about to go to sleep. Great. Um, another question that I see here is, what do you suggest for people who travel through different time zones? Uh, yes, so uh, so that's a, that will certainly impact both. It can certainly impact the uh, the duration of our sleep. Uh, jet lag is uh, is a, 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 a tough one, especially for those that are road warriors and, and travel frequently for work, because of the impact of circadian rhythms on the um, uh, uh, and time zones. So uh, there are a few strategies that can uh, can help to to make that. Of course, this does uh, you know ha ha have um, have a lot to say about how long you are at at the uh, uh, at the uh, at, at your destination. So if you are there for an extended period of time, the thing to do, or especially if it is uh, a long flight, the uh, to Make a conscious decision once you get on the plane that you are 
you set the time to your destination already. So if it is a red eye, or you're you're going, for example, over to uh, to let's say a long flight over to Europe, where we certainly know there's a lot of time time zone difference there. The um, that once you board the plane, pay attention to what time it is at your destination. So it, if it, if it is already close to uh, to to nighttime there, then try to get as much sleep as you can as early as possible. So as when you land, you'll be uh, uh, up, up, uh, as, at least closer to, to speed. If you are going, uh, you know, let's say, say to the West Coast, and so there's a three-hour time difference, but you're only there for a day or two, what usually works best is to just maintain your existing sleep schedule. Now, this does um, mean that you kind of, uh, uh, kind of need to either stay up, you need to go bed, bed a little bit earlier than you're accustomed to, or or stay up uh, a little bit later. But the uh, but if it's just a matter of a couple of days, then try to maintain the schedule that you are currently that is your normal schedule, uh, so as not to disrupt on both ends where you are, you know, struggling with when you are there and then struggling when you are coming back. But it does. Uh, but the thing to 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 think about with with time zone travel and, and jet lag, and the circadian aspect of this, if you have advance notice that you are about to travel, you can kind of uh, plan a few nights ahead to uh, and and try to sleep or set yourself up to the uh, the the sleep time and the the, the circadian aspect of your destination uh, in in advance. If that is possible, and uh, then that may help to make things more comfortable once you get to your destination. Great. Another question that's come through is: If you've already been diagnosed with sleep apnea, what treatment alternative do you recommend besides CPAP? Right. So, uh, so CPAP is the first line and most effective treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. It has the longest track record. And, uh, uh, and of course, the manufacturers are constantly uh, uh, improving the, uh, the mechanics, the noise, and the, the especially, most importantly, the mask interfaces. The, um, uh, but uh, not everybody is a candidate for, for PAP. Not everybody can tolerate the, uh, the pressure. Not everybody can tolerate the, uh, the, um, uh, the mask or, or are very sensitive to that. Uh, other treatment options, especially for those that have mild to moderate sleep apnea, would be oral appliance therapy. Oral appliance therapy is what is created by, fabricated by board-certified sleep medicine dentists. Uh, the device, it's called sometimes called an oral appliance. Uh, it's a mandibular advancement device, the mandible being the lower jaw. The way this uh, device works is that it, it's customized to a person's uh, bite, and it pulls, so they, when they put it in their mouth, it pulls the lower jaw forward so that the lower teeth are in front of the upper teeth. And uh, this increases, this pulls the soft tissue, the tongue and uh, this, uh, the, the soft tissue in the, in the, uh, in the throat forward and in, in the oral cavity forward. And it increases the size of the back of the airway and so prevents the, uh, the collapse of, uh, uh, of the tissue. Uh, this is, needs, requires to be customized to a person's bite. Uh, but for those that have more severe sleep apnea, the, the oral appliance will does not have as good uh, success rate as CPAP because the lower jaw would have to be pushed in such a forward position that it would be actually prohibitive and because you then run the risk of, of TMJ issues or temporal mandibular joint discomfort. Um, and uh, other treatment options that are, are also viable to treat sleep apnea are upper airway surgeries. This is, uh, these are procedures that are uh, performed by ear, nose, and throat surgeons. The typical procedure is called UPPP, U -P -P -P, and stands for uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty. And this is where the ear, nose, and throat surgeons will uh, surgically remove excess tissue from the uvula, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the pharynx, and, and the soft palate. So uh, the, um, but again, the, uh, this is, uh, uh, surgical intervention uh, is viable to treat sleep apnea, but uh, studies have shown that, unfortunately, the long-term effects of, of this, uh, this treatment or this intervention is uh, about seven years, which means that you can have perhaps a seven-year reprieve of snoring and sleep apnea, but typically 
studies have shown, long-term studies have shown that after even after such an intervention, uh, the um, uh, people are back in the sleep lab and would need to go on to to PAP because the uh, the sleep apnea is is so progressive over time. Yeah. So those are the the, the main. Well, lastly, one other uh, uh, intervention that is possible for especially for those that have positional sleep apnea, those that are, are, there are some individuals that have more sleep apnea when they sleep on their back compared to sleeping on, on other, other sleeping positions, the right side, left side, or on their stomach. Uh, so there is positional therapy. There are things that you can uh, purchase that will kind of be like a belt with a, a firm sponge on the, uh, on the back that prevents you from sliding onto your back. Uh, you know, previous remedies were to sew a pocket into a nightshirt and then put a tennis ball there. That has certainly, you know, was that was uh, was something that was done back in the day. Uh, but the goal being to, uh, and uh, we can see, we often see this in individuals that uh, come, come through our, our sleep testing that sleep apnea is much more pronounced when they sleep on their back because of gravity. This is when, when the, as I was saying earlier, uh, the upper airway tissue becomes very floppy, flimsy, and collapsible. We lose muscle tone, but then if we're sleeping on our back, the uh, this uh, this tissue that is has lost its muscle tone is able to slide into the back of the throat, reduce the size of the airway, and and promote sleep apnea. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you so much for that great explanation, Helgi. Um, we have several questions still coming in, and what we'll do, folks, is if we don't have time to respond, we will send you a note and address your questions individually. Um, and then our last question that we'll have time to take today is, what about talking in your sleep? How bad is that for the quality of your sleep if you talk regularly? Right. Actually, so of the, uh, the conditions or the, of the sleep behaviors, Actually, talking in your sleep is perhaps the most benign. The uh, it it uh, the um, it really does not disrupt your sleep in such a way because usually, or this may ha happen related to dreaming, or this may happen related to the deepest sleep stage. As long as you're not walking in your sleep or per performing any parasomnias, parasomnia is a is a is a behavior uh, in sleep. You know, talking in your sleep is <laughs> is outlined as a parasomnia, but it really is not a. Um, uh, it is quite benign. Uh, if, if you are awake uh, and you hear your partner talking, often this is can be quite quite uh, humorous. But the um, uh, and uh, but very very often, you know, you talk to somebody about this in the morning, they will have no recollection of, of what is going on. Uh, there are such um, uh, um, interesting uh, behaviors and processes that take place, and uh, and a lot of these are well documented and outlined in the book I was was mentioning earlier, "Why We Sleep" by uh, by Matthew Walker. They, they actually do do cover this quite uh, quite well um, in with the with the behaviors, but it really does not uh, disrupt sleep in such a way that it is arousing you from sleep, uh, like like a, a, a snore or a gasp would. So you, the brain is is certainly in in its restful restful state. So so even if you are talking or there is motion or there is uh, activity from the vocal cords, it is not going to, to disrupt your sleep. Thanks, Helgi. So as we approach the top of the hour, folks, I just wanted to thank everyone and especially Helgi for giving his time today to present um, this topic. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to join us and learn more. Um, the slide that's still on your screen, we encourage you, if you haven't taken your sleep checkup, to do so. It just takes a few minutes, and you can get informed about your DTQ, your duration, timing, and quality of your sleep, which is very interesting to know. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to call us or email us. And for those folks who have submitted questions that we weren't able to answer, we will be reaching out individually with the answers to those. So. On behalf of all of us here, thank you so much and have a great day.